Good afternoon, everybody. You're welcome to our um, workshop on the, the challenges and opportunities on the European agri-food sector. We have, we're very happy to have you all here. We had uh, a bit more than 100 registered participants at the, um, the latest, uh, the latest um, list. Let's see how many will join us actually today. You are used to that kind of meeting, so you know that not everybody joins, but usually people look also at the recordings. So this is also to mention that the, um, the recordings will be will be available after the after the workshop in a few days on our on the Interreg Europe uh, website. My my name is Luc Schmerber. I'm um, thematic expert for SMB competitiveness, and I will be one of your hosts today with my colleague Mart. Mart is already Hello. there. Yeah. Nice to see everybody here, and uh, looking forward for our discussions. Thank you, Mart. And in the in the background, we also have our colleague Lotte, who helps helps us with uh, the technic technical uh, different technical issues. In case we have some, but uh, you can at any time contact Lotte if you have problems with. Uh, thank you, Lotte, for showing. Uh, if you have problems through the chat, you can uh, send a message to to Lotte. Um, and uh, yeah, so we, without further much uh, words of introduction i will just uh, give um, a few information on the on the workshop on the workshop today and what uh, what what you will hear and what it is uh, what it is about so i hope you can see it properly Mark. does it work fine okay um so we, we are today to discuss on challenges and opportunities for the European agri-food sector. And uh, it is uh, in, in Interreg Europe, in the framework of our project, it is uh, linked to the support to sectors. We have different sectors and we see that the food sector uh, is represented or the agri-food sector, as we call it food, but uh, by five different projects. And it's one of the strongest sectors in terms of uh, sectors, uh, pro sector-based projects. I will briefly show the projects, the, the, the five projects I mentioned. They are all represented here today. You will hear uh, of all of them today. They they are here listed by by not by uh, alphabetical order, but by time order. You see that the SME Organics project is already closed. It is uh, focusing on the organic sector. You have the, the Eurega project uh, focusing on the whole gastronomy can help to to create economic growth and it's closing in a, in a few months and then we have three projects which uh, which uh, are from the last bunch of projects funded by interreg europe project fridge qualify and since i say we still have over a year to go but we will have we will hear more of them uh, later we'll also see and we go into detail into that i will not uh, preempt what our keynote speakers will say but to say that the the agri-food sector is a, a very important sector for the European economy, for the U European uh, manufacturing industry, especially it's the largest manufacturing sector in total. And it's also a big employer. And you can see here, I took the image from uh, one of the publications of our since IFC project. It's at the crossroad of different European policies. And we will hear from that in the, in the different uh, presentations. But we are here addressing a sector which is everywhere on the policy policy agenda. Shortly, the agenda for today, uh, we will first have two keynote speakers who will present about the, the European perspective. First, Elvira from the EIT Food, and uh, then uh, Chabols from EIP Agri. They are both already here with us. After that, we'll, uh, we planned a short uh, networking break where um, you might have the opportunity to ask additional questions to our speakers. And we go then into two thematic sessions, the first one on brands, label, and quality, the second one on entrepreneurship in the agri-food sector before closing around the quarter to, to five. For some of you, we had the opportunity to book uh, some slots for online experts, help desks with uh, Martin and myself, and this will start uh, at five o'clock. Um, according to plan, actually, uh, until a quarter to six, but we are available for any questions, even going beyond that. 
So let's go directly into the topic um, with our first keynote speaker, Elvira from, um, from the EIT Food. Elvira, you, the floor is yours for the next 15 to 20 minutes, and uh, we can uh, take some questions after your, your speech, of course, but uh, participants can already uh, send questions in through the chat if they want to. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. And um, very nice to see uh, the, to be here this afternoon after this uh, small uh, technical detail. Uh, I'm seeing my screen black. Okay. You are seeing it well, right? Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I, I, it keeps coming black and I don't know why. I'm sorry, but I can, I can just... Okay. I hope it is good now. No, no, the second slide is black. I don't know why. Maybe we can, yeah, we can share. Yeah, I don't know what happened. Now it's see. green. Right. No, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's. Well, I will <laughs> skip the first one then. Um, yeah, as I was saying, it is a pleasure being here this afternoon. And as we are almost after lunch, let's start with a bit of an interactive uh, session, um, just so you know a bit more about the the challenges on the agri food system and some of the reasons why EAT food was uh, created, which in part was to address some of them or as much of them as uh, we can. Um, if I and feel free on the um, if I ask you about the percentage of the food produced in the world that uh, gets lost or wasted every year, how much of it do you think it is? Um, I cannot see the chat right now, but I will um, tell you, yeah, 35, 25%, actually it is 30% of it that it gets uh, lost every year. Um, yeah, here it is. Uh, this is a huge amount. Billion dollars. It is incredible, uh, an incredible opportunity behind this food waste. But let's go uh, to another huge figure that is uh, on on our society, and is uh, the percentage or the amount of overweighted people across the world. It highs up to two billion people, with 800 million of undernourished people all across the world. This is uh, showing how distorted the nutritional and um, habits are currently all around the world. And last but not least, if we have a look at the successful startups that are um, developing their businesses all across uh, Europe, we have to realize that now nine out of ten of them fail on the process of becoming a successful business. So these challenges are saying that we have societal, environmental and um, economical challenges that we really need to, to address um, right now. If we have um, a closer look at the agri-food sector in Europe right now, what we are seeing is that this, it, it is that the agri-food sector is under rising pressure. Um, the food prices are increasing be, be for, uh, due to several reasons, and uh, this can lead to a situation where the food security, the affordability are impacted, the healthiness and the nutritional habits, as I was saying before, also get impacted, and that circular economy doesn't develop in the proper way. Next to that, um, the and the habits from consumers since the pandemic have uh, drastically changed. The um, e-commerce has grown like never before, and it has duplicated or triplicated um, their numbers in the past two years. Still, for the low-income uh, groups, the price has become the key food choice. Okay, and and we have to keep that in mind for the future uh, food development. Um, as Luke was saying before, the agri-food sector is one of the biggest employers and manufacturing sectors across the Europe. So uh, this is a, an opportunity that we also have to, to take care with. 
And on the other hand, we need to transform the agri-food system and the land use um, to cover the sustainable development goals. However, there is a huge opportunity, 4.5 trillion uh, opportunity for business development there. So it's not all challenges on transforming the agri-food system, but there are great opportunities on developing and transforming the agri-food sector to a more healthier and sustainable and trusted for all the population. If we also have a look at the corporate uh, venture and how the investors and venture corporate um, uh, firms are investing their the money, um, we can see that the investments in agri-tech and food tech have been growing and growing since the past uh, years. If we look at the agri-food side, the, the biggest investments have been in farming and crop tech, as you can see here with these figures. Um, if we look at the food properly said, the food processing, we can see that the food delivery, the alternative proteins and other plant-based products are the areas where the investments have been bigger and the deals have been higher. Okay, so we can see how the, um, the agri-food sector is moving towards. And um, with this, we can define some great uh, opportunities across the sector. On one hand, um, and I would like to give you an overview of the emerging trends that we are currently seeing. On one hand, we have um, the packaging. And packaging now has to cover goals on sustainability and hygiene. Um, and biomaterials are going into mainstream instead of being uh, niche uh, products. There is a huge focus on uh, under, underused and forgotten uh, crops, um, having a wider biodiversity, also um, bringing added value to the local communities and natural ecosystems. There is a higher use um, of upcycled and rescued ingredients, the immunofoods and using foods to, um, to have a better food system, sorry, a better food um, immune system um, is of increased importance. Um, we can say also that there is a back to basics where um, people are more and more um, concerned about the ingredients, about the processes, about the social responsibility of the products they are, um, they are having. And there is a um, strong connection that um, is uh, having more and more importance in between healthiness and emotional well-being. On top of that, and across all of them, there is this technology acceleration that um, can help to know and to track uh, the food on across the whole supply chain. For this reason, in E80 Food, we are currently working across six uh, focus areas, alternative proteins, sustainable agriculture, targeted nutrition, sustainable aquaculture, digital traceability, and circular food systems. Of course, having digital transformation across all of them and the consumer centricity to satisfy the current and the future demands of the consumers across these six um, areas. And if you let me go in a bit more in deep into each of them, I can tell you that, for example, in the area of diversified proteins, we can see that um, only 20 of the new alternative proteins are estimated to grow at more than 36% per year, while the conventional proteins are only growing at 2.4% per year. This is a huge opportunity for business developments and we can see that uh, as well that in the past years, um, the, uh, the highest uh, percentage of uh, investment have, has been made on alternative proteins startups, as I was showing in the previous slide as well. Here, um, the, the edible insects uh, market will grow as well in a, in a huge amount, and it will be also, uh, or it will equal the um, sustainable aquaculture uh, market. We have to take uh, or to, to keep in mind that the new generations like millennials and Gen Z population are um, have higher predisposition to ha to consume these alternative proteins than the older generations. Where are the opportunities? As I was saying, insect protein, both for animal and uh, human consumption, cultivated meat that um, the developments in technology and legislation are facilitating their, um, their uh, reach to market. Um, fermentation processes that have uh, a lower investment cost 
and um, uh, we we will see a further expansion beyond the the current uh, burgers or meatballs or sausages on the plant-based meat and fish category. Next to this, there will be a look for uh, non-allergic uh, substitutes and a wider variety of ingredients uh, from alternative proteins. And here, just to give you a few examples on some of the startups that have higher, that have had the highest uh, investments in the past years, and which are having deals with the major uh, food processors. And <laughs> um, talking about Novamid, for example, when I met his um, founder, he said, "Look, Elvira, one day uh, we will be tired of having burgers. This is why I am trying to mimic the stick uh, texture, so that we have in the future something something that is completely different to a burger or a meatball or a sausage. We want a different texture. We will be tired of this um, texture that we are having now. So, and this is what we are seeing as well in many other um, startups." <clears throat> if we go into sustainable agriculture, what we can see that sustainable farming is increasing, that the percentage of uh, utilized agricultural area dedicated to organic farming is increasing. The farmers um, are replaced by um, young farmers as well, and these young farmers are taking uh, more care for having organic farms. And uh, we can see also uh, on a 20%, 21% versus 10% of non-organic farms with uh, younger generations. Digitalization offers also uh, agriculture a, a faster way to recover from, from the COVID-19 crisis. And in sustainable agriculture, what we are seeing is some tendencies on regenerative agriculture that this one i would say it is one of the most important because if it has this three win-win situation um having a, a better result for the planet for the consumers but also for the farmers um we are also seeing tendencies on water management having uh, investments in irrigations but also um decreasing and having better management of the uh, water in animal production and digitalization as i was saying before across all um, agriculture sector using blockchain drones sensors monitoring systems will be all across um the the agriculture um there is a tricky balance in, in the agriculture and the sustainable agriculture because on one hand, the citizens tend to underestimate the, the impact that they are having on the environment. And on the other, they want to see um, uh, how the food is uh, produced, how it has been um, generated and all this sustainability information on the food labels. Um, however, not many of them are uh, willing to pay this um, or to spend more on this sustainable food. So we need to, uh, what we see is that there is a need for more awareness and more education on this uh, importance on sustainable um, agriculture. If we go to targeted nutrition, as I was saying before, um, some of the trends that we see is uh, the importance of uh, immune resilience. Uh, most of the population now uh, takes care about the ingredients and how they can support their immune health. The proactive health um, using the diet to have a um, healthier day-to-day -day life instead of using it as a, um, a recovering. Um, and here we see that health and nutrition, the is one of the reasons behind moving to a plant-based uh, meat alternatives, having uh, more proteins when uh, uh, when they are aging, um, in using it to have a, a better digestive health, but also reducing sugar so that we have this uh, quality calorie concept that is uh, less uh, that when consumers know that um, the, the nutritional profile of different uh, sources of ingredients is different to another. Um, there are um, uh, artificial intelligence algorithms that are currently used, and uh, this includes the use of uh, self-monitoring and wearables um, to monitor your, your health, which will be trending in the coming years. There are also uh, biomarker discoveries to study those groups um, that have been historically underrepresented. Um, the food science and the scientists are also doing a lot more research on the food components and how they interact uh, and how their interactions have an impact in, in our health and in our mental health as well. And uh, 
across Europe, I would say that there is a boom for the microbiome, um, which has um, the potential to unlock a new layer of personalization for the, for the food sector. Um, going into sustainable aquaculture, as I was saying before, the algae production is an emerging trend, is very promising, and it has it will have a major impact in the blue bioeconomy across uh, uh, the Europe market. Um, the, but still, there are uh, a lot of opportunities because um, the, in, the market demand is increasing, and we need to make sure that we can cover this demand in an economic, social, and environmentally friendly way. And for this reason, there are opportunities for genetic improvements on uh, fishes and their species um, for the use and the water management, as uh, I, I have mentioned before as well, for the use of uh, fish oil and other alternative proteins and the use of oral vaccines. And of course, the digitalization across all the aquaculture um, sector. I have given here a few examples of uh, startups that are currently working on sustainable aquaculture and that use, uh, are using uh, pre precision fishing to, to catch only the, the species that are really wanted, uh, using novel uh, proteins to feed fish and also having a better taste, but also preservation technologies and using algae with higher omega-3 content. And let's go last but not least, uh, oh, sorry, it's not the last one, but digital traceability. Uh, I said before that transparency is one of the key um, topics identified as uh, trending in 2021. Having uh, increased transparency across all the uh, food supply chain is of uh, major important, importance for all consumers. Taking care of uh, the ethical, the environmental, the labeling, the animal and uh, human welfare um, will be of major and major importance in the coming years. Um, the technologies as well going wider than, than this uh, transparency um, issue go on precision agriculture, blockchain, image, image image recognition and machine learning. And the good thing that we are seeing is that both farmers and consumers are more and more comfortable by using um, uh, digital, digital uh, tools um, when buying, but also when producing food. And we can see also that the big players on the market are investing more and more in, this, uh, in these firms, in these uh, startups that are um, supporting with the traceability of food products all across the food chain. As I said before, food waste is of major importance as well. And if we have a look at circular food systems, we can see that um, uh, uh, the market will be uh, of 34.2 uh, billion in, uh, or it's been already on 34.1 billion and it, it will keep going. Um, and here, the major uh, areas will have on biodegradable and uh, edible packaging, on products made of uh, surplus, but also upcycling waste uh, for byproducts, using cold chain management and smart solutions for um, a better food retail and food service, and increasing the self lives on products. We have to take into account that from this 30% of food that is uh, wasted, 50% happens at home. So uh, increasing uh, shelf life and improving the cold chain management at home will be of uh, major importance. Again, the major players are investing in these solutions. And yeah, as a summary, because I don't want to spend uh, more of your time, um, which are the, 20 pr the projections from 2020 to 2030? Digitalization, uh, this will be key and it will help also, it will be a key engine for the economic development of the, of the agri-food sector. Packaging and the use of biomaterials uh, going into mainstream and having a sustainable and uh, covering sustainable and hygiene goals. The milk, dairy and meat sector uh, will be shaped uh, because of this alternative proteins uh, demand. Uh, there will be also high, or there is also uh, a higher demand on the fruit and, and vegetable sector. The insect farming will grow massively to, uh, and it will be used to re reduce food waste, um, using it for uh, fish, animal feeding, but also for human consumption. Um, and 
um, the shorter having a shorter supply chain um, will acquire more importance. Um, as I said, the farm uh, workforce is expected to to decline at a lower percentage, but the technological progress and the machinery and the monitoring development um, will have an an importance here. And that was all. I don't know if I am on time. I hope so, <laughs> because I didn't want to take most more of your time. So I try to keep it uh, very yeah. short. That's fine, Elvira. Th th thank you for your, your on, on time and thank you for this comprehensive overview. And I, I take the, the opportunity to, the question was raised in the chat, the, the slides will be available afterwards also. And I, I've seen your slides before, so the, there's a lot of information into that. We, we, have, we have some time to take a few, a few questions directly to, um, for, for Elvira. Uh, maybe while you're writing them in the chat or raising your hand to, to show, I have, one, I have one to start. Elvira, you, you, you are responsible of this, this regional innovation scheme. Uh, yeah, it is, maybe you, um, you could say a few words what, what, what it does and how it can help uh, people locally also to, to develop, because uh, we have a lot, a lot of local regional policy makers or, or business developer, what, so what kind of support they can find with, with your organization, maybe locally. Of course, and thank you very much for the question, Luke, because we do have plenty of initiatives in almost every uh, area that I have uh, mentioned. Uh, we mm -hmm. have a program, we have one in uh, water scarcity all across Southern uh, Europe, which is one of the, the, some of the regions with the highest challenges. We have also a major program on regenerative agriculture that is being currently implemented across Spain, Italy, Portugal, and Poland. But we have many other um, initiatives. And for policymakers, we have some um, programs that I would say are really important because they help not only to put, not only to expand the network, the network of uh, policymakers, but also to get um, direct knowledge from industries and food processors on what are the current trends. Uh, um, also to get to know more and better about uh, policies that are happening across other countries in the, um, in the EU. Uh, this program specifically, it's called Government Executive Academy, and I, I write it uh, later on in the chat. Yeah. Thank we you. also have uh, another program that is called Research Infrastructure Network. And in this program, what we are doing is putting in touch um, those research um, uh, groups that are at the universities and research uh, centers with uh, policymakers that are uh, dealing with the development of the S3, S4 now, and uh, other agri-food sector um, policies. Why? Because we have seen that sometimes what is missed is the links in between the policymakers, the industry, the research, and also the education. So we are trying to really link them all and having common projects so that they can learn uh, from each other. And uh, we also have uh, a group that uh, is uh, our group of advisors at RIS. We call it a RIS Policy Council. And here, um, all of yeah. these policymakers uh, that are working or related to the development or the implementation or design of the S3 and, and S4 um, thematics are welcome. They help us to, to design uh, our strategy, to define these challenges, but also the opportunities and to see and have an overview across all Europe on, this, uh, on the current policies and, and the current changes as well that are needed mm -hmm. across uh, all countries. So plenty of opportunities. <laughs> yeah, but maybe we, we've um, we've already included in the chat the link to to the EIT food to the website. But if you have more specific information, you might just put it in the in the, yes. the, 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 the chat. And you you demonstrated very well. Sometimes we have the, this image of the, the agri food sector being a bit traditional and not so much innovative. But we see there is a lot of innovation happening in the in the area. Uh, Mark, do, uh, just quickly, do you see? If, do we have questions in the chat from uh, for LDR? Um, There's one question about whether uh, your network or is or you're also involved in projects related to crops, uh, genetic resources, uh, so recovering or improvement of varieties or similar. 
Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, not me directly, but I am aware that some of our partners in EIT Food are involved and in developing currently some some product some projects that are actually working with the genetic and improving the genetics of some crops to to improve their resilience and their adaptability to to climate change. So yes, um, there are a few, and of course. Um, now um, EIT food is becoming more and more open and in our innovation calls we are accepting also partners and non-partners um, to, to, to develop different projects across these uh, yeah. areas that I was mentioning before. Okay, thank, thank you Elvira. I think we will move to the, the, the second speaker. Elvira, if I hope you maybe you can stay with us until until uh, three o'clock, so maybe some uh, some questions will uh, will um, come up and uh, we have some opportunities be, before going into the thematic session. Uh, but I will now give the, the word to Shabols from the, um, the EIP Agri. Uh, yes. We can see your slides well, uh, Shabols, please go on. Thank you very much uh, for, for the word and uh, good afternoon for everyone. Uh, Avira had a very nice presentation about the market possibilities of uh, this sector. Uh, it seems almost could be a vision for the future, but uh, how things are, are going and developing. But I think in my, in my uh, presentation, I would like to highlight, uh, highlight something which is much more closer to the ground. Because, you know, we have farmers and they have their own, own thinking and their own methods. And I would like to introduce what we, EI Bagri Innovation and uh, uh, Knowledge Exchange uh, operating for uh, reaching also the possibilities but coming from opportunities and, and challenges in the near future. For, for getting this invitation, even the world changed a lot in two weeks. So, you know, we have to react very quickly and there are uh, totally other issues coming as important even in the short term. So we have to uh, pace uh, with, with the, the needs uh, dictates. So in my presentation, I would like to uh, introduce you the role of our facility to overcoming the challenges and promoting op pure opportunities for the European agriculture and food sector. Uh, European Commission started uh, Operation European Innovation Partnership of Agricultural Productivity and Sustainability 10 years ago with the aim of foster a competitive and sustainable agriculture that achieves more from less. But we always have to keep an eye on, on future proofing that means take advantage of new opportunities, but also prepare for challenges that arise. So we also have to be very careful with bridging the gaps between research and practice, which is uh, the main objective, our uh, support facility in operation. We see new tasks arising for top network, and the main of our task is a building up a well-functioning agricultural knowledge and innovation systems at the whole EU level. With also the challenges for fostering a smart, resilient agriculture and food security with uh, viable farming camps, market orientation, competitiveness, and the improving farmers' position in the value chain. We also have to consider the environmental care and climate action and contributing to environment and climate objectives as well. Among efficient management of natural resources, protection of biodiversity and enhancing ecosystem services. And on the other hand, we also have to keep up 
with strengthening the socioeconomic fabric of rural areas with business development, employment growth, social inclusion, and local development. These are the main issues which uh, gives floor to uh, objective of our support faci facility, which uh, promoting the peer-to-peer -peer learning and interaction among all agricultural and rural stakeholders, reorganizing network activities, conferences, analytical work, cross visits, brokerage activities, and ad, ad hoc expert meetings. And with similar effects, we try to foster innovation support with inclusion of stakeholders in the knowledge exchange and knowledge building processes in agriculture. If we see the biggest picture, our, our building blocks are seen as operational groups at the left, where partners with farmers, advisors, researchers, ag agribusinesses, NGOs, and even consumers could prepare solving issues in an innovative way and uh, taking uh, innovation support services provided by EIP networks. On the other hand, there are also you know, innovative multi-actor projects uh, or originated by Horizon 2020 uh, research projects, multi-actor projects and thematic networks where uh, also this operational group uh, building stones participation is strongly recommended. And this uh, knowledge repository of contacts and practice abstracts are coming available and could be spread among uh, farmers and communities as well. Let's see what uh, operational groups are dealing, so which are the largest challenges and opportunities seen in, in the operation of this group. We see the numbers of, of projects dealing with uh, farming practices. It's an example like more than 700 operational groups aiming to have some uh, solutions, innovative solutions, good example to collect and spread in this issue. And if we typize, if we typi, typ, typical issues are, are, are production systems and uh, competitiveness issues. So these are also connected to uh, production with uh, plant, horticulture, animal husbandry, and other. We see also very important uh, the soil issues like fertilization and nut nutrient management, pest disease control, soil management, environmental issues, biodiversity, climate change, water management, uh, waste management issues. And we also see that uh, a considerable part belongs to supply chain uh, management and, and food, food, food quality processing. Uh, uh, projects. There are almost uh, 2,200 operational groups operating at this moment. And from the CAP strategy plans, it's already indicated there are about 6,000 more will be operating in the near future. So there is a large need about this type of uh, intervention among uh, uh, the AECIS uh, members. Of course, uh, one project is not only dealing just with only one issue. So these are about uh, 6,000 uh, uh, aims coming out of 2,100 operational groups, so around three aim connecting to each operational group. Let's see how uh, we planning to boosting this, this knowledge, what uh, could be, be gained with this innovative approach. Of course, at the heart, at the middle, there is the farmers and uh, they connecting with advisors, researchers, education, business, 
consumers and NGOs in the middle circle. In the side, uh, you can see uh, other tasks which go in clockwise, like building the knowledge reservoirs, the collaborations for innovative solutions, integrating advisors to bridge research with practice, co-creating innovation with EIP operational groups and multi-actor projects, connecting through uh, CAP networks, involving young farmers and education, and stimulating uh, competent advice and uh, support for farmers. So this is the system operating. And of course, we trying to linking all the innovation actors in this uh, type of networks with help desk functions, organization of events like focus group, workshops and seminars for the participants. We have online printed publications and databases available. And we also have a communication product to uh, spread the uh, procedures and results. We already have 46 focus group, 38 events. We have 250 publications and we also could be found on social media. Of course, we have a very large extended project database containing uh, operational groups and multi-actor projects as well. These are uh, searchable information on details, mainly the setting up, uh, the projects, the results, and the outcomes uh, of the projects. We are still would like to have in the next programming period in the frame of the new CUP network organizing by the fall of this year to stimulate innovation and improve exchange of knowledge with this uh, multi-actor approach and support this uh, agricultural knowledge and innovation system by uh, connecting policies and instruments to speed up info innovation with added value of improving linkages connect innovation actors and projects, uh, promoting innovative solutions as good examples, and inform the researchers about uh, further research need achieving uh, from the farming practice and uh, disseminating the results of the projects, in particular the CAP network as well. And finally, I would like to thank you for listening. Also ask or propose to register to website or connect to website or subscribe to our monthly newsletter to be the first about the, the news of uh, what's happening with us. And also you can consult with us uh, personally as well. Thank you, Sabold. So we have also time for a few questions to, to Sabold. And my, my, my first one would be similarly to, to the one for, for Elvira. How does it work in practice for our regional organization to, to, to get involved um, uh, in the, in, for instance, the operational groups or otherwise in the activity of the, the, the EIP, EIP agree? Uh, it it uh, you know the setup of the operational groups is originated by the rural development plans mm -hmm. so there were uh, measures connecting to eip network and also in the strategic plans it will be available there are of course rule of participation but startups uh, farmers researchers education uh, 
rural businesses could be part of uh, the development project and they initiate a problem which they are uh, looking for uh, res results or, or, or uh, research uh, findings. And this could be financed by uh, this support. And of course, uh, there are similar problems could be experienced all around Europe. So these uh, groups could be connected and linked together as network, and they can have common solutions for common problems or see good examples. For example, it, now there is ongoing two focus group. One is about uh, uh, the FAST tool, the uh, uses of, of the FAST, so uh, the uh, fertilizer uh, management of, of uh, pro agricultural production. And other is uh, uh, how to reduce uh, nutrients in, in horticultural issues. So there are usually cross uh, compliance issues raising with with, with two issues like organic farming and the importance of, of uh, water management, for example. And uh, those uh, participants and experts with uh, an open call could participate to this event when a report is made and, and made available on, on our website for, for further. Uh, okay inform parties okay and could you give maybe one example of how, how it works with the, the financial support uh, which kind of financial support is available or you mentioned uh, financial support I think. yes these are uh, supported by the rural development plans okay yeah for cap strategic plans and almost 90 countries financing it from rural development support and our national support for the others as well. Because there are some countries, for example, Denmark not, not using this measure in, in its uh, rural development plan, but it uh, provides support at a national level for this uh, aim. Okay, thank you. So Bolz, we, Mark, can, do we have questions from the, the audience for for at uh, this point? No, not at the moment. So I think it's a good time to have the discussion together with Elvira as well. Yeah, mate. Okay, we have a few minutes where we discussed in the chat briefly with Mart and uh, as we had some some technical um, technical issues uh, at the, the, the beginning, we were just, just keeping the break and take a few minutes to, to go back to, to, to Shabolt and Elvira. If, so if you have questions, you are still, it's still the time to 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 raise to raise them, uh, we you 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 mentioned a lot of trends and challenges both both of you and I, I wanted to 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 ask in uh, if if you would have to 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 to, to prioritize where where is where do you see the 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 the, the, the major trends or the major challenges is it is it related to to, to technology more is it more related to to consume your behavior, to where, where, where do you see the, the 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 really big big thing for the the next uh, the next years from your perspective? Um, who wants to start? I would say they are quite interlinked yeah. um, because, um, for example, there is a huge opportunity on the diversified uh, protein market, but this becomes also forced because uh, the consumers have changed their consumer habits. Uh, there is also digitalization all across uh, the areas, and this comes also forced because uh, farmers, manufacturers, um, food retailers and consumers are using and are more comfortable by using uh, digital tools on a on a regular basis. 
Um, can can you see that already? See. Sorry, Elver, on the because you, you are de dealing a lot with uh, very high high level uh, things. Can you see that already? Some evolution in terms of market shares, or is it is it early signals? What you 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 measuring? Do, do you do you have a feeling for that? It's not easy. But, uh... Yeah, it's not, <laughs> it's not easy. But this is what, for example, we have a program that is called uh, test, test Farms. Uh, in this program, we we look for farmers that are willing to test new technologies. Yeah from startups and we look for startups that are ready to to test uh, their products on uh, on the land uh, we started with 10 farmers in spain a few years ago and now we are having the program all across uh, the risk countries in 17 countries and uh, having uh, many different uh, applications from uh, all across Europe to test their technologies in new markets and uh, and farmers being, being more, more and more willing to um, to accept these new technologies on their uh, lands. So I can see that I would say at every level um, and sometimes um, yeah the policy doesn't help uh, or doesn't go as fast as uh, as the um, as the changes <laughs> that the society is, is applying, but yeah. Um, what, what, what do you mean that? Uh, sorry, Shabols, I think you yeah. were just yeah, wanting I, to. I, yeah. yeah, I would uh, highlight this issue from another angle, from the view of the farmers, and it seems that uh, digitalization is an issue, but uh, innovations, as usual, not spreading too fast and uh, even by farmers there are uh, obstacles like uh, digital illiteracy that uh, these programs are pretty complicated to operate operate and even it's hard to get out the results so we have to make these uh, technological uh, issues uh, easily accessed for farmers mm -hmm. and we should also try to keep in mind that the final decision are for the farmers themselves they like to keep it you know and they just don't want to rely on something which tells them uh, what to do that is the first issue and that's why in yeah. my presentation i try to highlight yeah. the by the number of operational groups still still dealing with the uh, production issues themselves. You know, that surprised me. And it's yeah. that's not a surprise that uh, also environmental issues are getting much more interesting, but we also have to consider those from the view of these, the uh, farmer's income, because of course they, they are risking their income as well. Yeah, I think Elvira mentioned that this is uh, there. There are growing expectation, but the, 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 at the end, the readiness to pay for, for, for all of that is not is not always okay. given. Right? And on, uh, and on the other hand, there are methods like uh, peer to peer learning. Farmers like to learn yeah. each other, yes. have it, seeing good example, go and visit uh, uh, farms to to get to know what's, uh, what's happening. And it's, this is a very good uh, potential how to spread uh, good innovation. Yeah, I think you have touched a key point and is uh, the way of learning for farmers and uh, learning from one farmer to, to another. It is something that we have experiment, experimented having a great result. And we are we are doing that with uh, with some of our programs because it's the it's the best practice that we have uh, identified. Mm -hmm. uh, so you are completely right. Um, but also uh, sometimes by using these new new ways of or transitioning to new and more sustainable uh, farming practices, what we have seen is that. Uh, the expenditure, the, the investment uh, and the return of investment for farmers is higher, while there is this um, perception that they have to invest more and they have uh, less um, less winning or less benefit. And this is a kind of a myth sometimes, and we need to overcome that barrier as well. So it's I, I understand uh, what Sabrox is, is uh, saying because He's right, uh, 
but we, we also need to overcome that uh, that barrier because in some cases we are seeing that the benefits are higher than the than the investments and also when in initiatives like uh, ours um what we do is trying to minimize the the resources needed from the farmer side so minimize their risk uh, when they are testing new technologies uh, otherwise uh, you never get to the farmers and they are never <laughs> willing yeah. to to test in first in instance um yeah, yeah. and you having user friendly technology is is a, a basic i would say as well just i would like to add that it's it's not definite that if you invest more, that uh, you yield more. So yeah, if no, you invest more, yeah. you have more risk and you might have more, but that's not for sure. That, that's, 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 that's why, that's why yeah. farmer avoiding yeah. risk. Yeah, what I mean, for example, is on uh, regenerative agriculture programs, um, sometimes there is this uh, myth that if they are not spending on fertilizers and pesticides, um, they will not get any any anything out of the crop. And we have seen that it's not happening. It, it's uh, reversing. So um, that is something that we can that we can start changing uh, how how they are thinking about it. Thank you, thank you, Elvira. Thank you, Shabolz. We we have to wrap up here. But I, I keep from your discussion both you mentioned, and that's uh, also the way we try to work here. It's it's about um, yeah good practice and promote and the peer to peer learning and working on uh, the, the, the the dissemination of, of good practices. So also in policies there is room for that, obviously. <laughs> and, and and you and you and you pro and you provide also the the um, let's say the the. The playground for for also for our policymakers to yeah to improve their policies towards uh, agri food uh, sectoral uh, development which is uh, so in between uh, we thank you Elvira you published also in the chat the the, the links to to your services and also uh, on the slides from Shabols uh, people will can can join the the resource wealth of the EIP agree so it's plenty to learn and to get involved with with you hopefully because that's 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 what it is about also today so th thank you for being with us uh today um people have your contact details have access to to your um, to your resources so hopefully some collaboration will will emerge from from that and for now looking uh, looking at the time we are Approximately in time, um, Matt, we can move to our the first thematic session. I would, uh, I would say, and a big thank you again to to Elvira and um, and Chabolch for being with us today. Yep. Thank you, Luke. Um, I presume you can see my screen. It works fine. Great. Uh, so yeah, th thank you also from from my side to both the keynote speakers. I think wealth of uh, knowledge and information was shared that our next two thematic sessions can build upon. Um, so first, we have this sec section on uh, brands and labels and quality. So it links a bit to this transparency uh, issue and potentially consumer demand that Elvira was talking about. And later on, we go on promoting entrepreneurship uh, in, in Luke's session uh, in the afternoon. So um, I, I think it's a good place to develop this uh, exchange of thoughts uh, further. Um, so in this, um, session, I just want to highlight that that from, from our side, we have also looked at this topic briefly, of course, not, not as uh, deeply as uh, AIP and IIT um, agree to it, but um, uh, but just for you to know that we, we last year, we published a policy brief on regional branding for SME success. And, uh, but this was a broader look on the topic. So we looked at uh, also tourism and the creative and culture industries, uh, as well as agriculture. So today, it's a good opportunity to zoom in on, on the agri-food sector. Um, and this is what we will do in, in our session. Um, here is a, a quote from one of these um, uh, common agri agricultural policy objectives paper on why quality schemes are necessary. Uh, so there is seen an added value uh, for the rural economies uh, and also uh, to uphold this, uh, the traditions and culture and geography of, of different areas. And um, I know that we already talked a bit about policy, but just to quickly mention a few things, then the branding and quality tends to be more of a horizontal topic on the EU policy level, especially if you think of branding also involving 
uh, tourism, and then it gets much, much wider. Um, but a lot of different policies touch upon it, and a lot of different uh, financing sources are used on, on the commission level as well uh, to support um, uh, different initiatives. Of course, the, the main framework uh, comes from the common agricultural policy, um, and, and one of their specific objectives uh, is about this farmer position and value change, and that's also where the quote on the last slide uh, came from. Uh, then, of course, EU quality policy uh, is an important um, framework. So you might have seen these abbreviations in the past. So these are these EU level confirmed uh, quality uh, labels uh, to protect specific products from the uh, specific geographic areas. Um, farm to fork strategy, uh, very important in, in regards to European Green Deal, a Green Deal uh, that um, aims to make the food systems uh, fair and healthy and then environmentally friendly. Uh, and this links to, to um, also to branding in a sense, because they in 2021, I think it was in July, this EU code of conduct for responsible food and business marketing practices was published as a, as a voluntary scheme to join with this. Um, so it links to branding from there. Um, and EU eco label, uh, which is more about sustainability and in keeping up with environmental standards throughout the life cycle. This is not only for agriculture, but it's broader, but still uh, something you might encounter where you, when you think of uh, branding and quality on this sort of a EU level. Um, but then we get to the national and regional and private schemes. So, so different re regions and countries implement their own various uh, quality or, or branding labels. Uh, and this is what we're going to do with the rest of our session with, with our free speakers. So uh, in this thematic session, we've invited uh, free uh, free experts from our community, uh, so from our inter Europe projects, uh, representing different uh, different projects uh, and different practices. So we have Emma Eva Comar Thomas from uh, Catalonia, Spain, uh, who will uh, who will talk about the actions to prevent fraud and foster authenticity that they've been implementing. And then we have Jerome Sinel uh, talking about uh, the Territoria Bio Engage label. Uh, and finally, we have Hanna Merilainen uh, from um, from Finland uh, talking about this. Um, a food province label that they have implemented in South Ostrobotina. Uh, so uh, I would stop speaking here and I would invite uh, my speakers or our, our guests to come and, and very uh, in their quick presentations to um, show us what they're doing and then we'll open up the floor for, for discussions with our free speakers. So please, Eva, you will be the first. Uh, you should now be able to share your screen. Oh, sorry, I need to start sharing first, yes. Can you see? Can you see the screen? Or yep, I see it. Uh, you can also put it into presenter mode. Um. For me, is it uh, okay? Now? Yes, you need to do this. The change of the screens in the top that we uh, configuratio. Uh, no, no, I, I can't see. Ah, uh, now, no configuration. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. Now? Yes. Okay, perfect. now? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I, I represent the, the Qualify um, project. In my short presentation, I will present uh, uh, a practice um, that I think is, uh, is representative of, uh, of our project. Qualify has been designed to foster competitiveness of the small and medium industries in the agri food sector by improving uh, quality processes, fighting against fraud, and also uh, promoting authenticity. In my case, I, I, I belong uh, to the Subdirectorate of Inspection and Agri-Food Control. Our subdirection, subdirection is in charge of official control of food industries. This uh, official control is at regional level in Catalonia, Spain. And as a result of our inspections, we have detected that many of the irregularities of the small and medium industries are due to ignorance of the regulations. As you know, regulation changes and are updated very often. And sometimes small and medium industries have uh, difficulties to access to it uh, because they have a small staff teams or because of lack of um, economical means. So uh, the practice that I present uh, were, were carried out uh, with the objective of provide this information in a practical and easy way. 
on one hand, a specific space has been created on the department's website. And on the other hand, every month we publish a newsletter with a topic related with, uh, to, to food quality. On the website, there are sections related to fight against fraud, official control, regulations, food alerts, documents of interest, important news, etc. Uh, we want also to highlight that our unit has drawn up uh, specific guides, uh, different guides about fraud control, another of uh, on control systems implementation, another of effective content control, another more specific uh, to particular sectors which can be downloaded uh, from the same web page. There is a section uh, in, in the web page related to mandatory labeling and also sector specific uh, labeling sections. At the moment for the most relevant food sectors in our region, but our intention is uh, to increase this uh, sectorial contents in the future. Here you have uh, two examples of the web sheets. The first one is, uh, is about compulsory labeling. And the second one belongs to a specific sector, to oil sector, and is uh, also about uh, labeling mentions. The monthly newsletter, it's named Qualimen newsletter, provide also food companies with um, information of their interest. Uh, it includes regulation news, workshops, uh, events, current cases of fraud, uh, inspection results, and some other links of interest. It is uh, also interesting to note that we also organize presential and uh, virtual workshops to deal with the contents of the web page, whether these are workshops to present uh, the guide sometimes, or I'm at going more deeply into specific regulations or sometimes uh, uh, new regulations. These workshops um, are carried out as a response to specific demands of uh, different sectors, or sometimes when in the course of our inspections, uh, we identified th this need. Here you can see the number of uh, visits to the web pages on food quality and fight against, uh, fight against fraud. Uh, you see there are more or less uh, 6,000 uh, in 2021. Uh, the number of views um, were one, 160,000, more or less. And about the number of uh, um, the newsletter, the Qualimen newsletter, we publish 11 uh, newsletters every year. And now last month, in February 22, was published the number um, 58. The number of people registered in the newsletter is uh, high. It is, um, more than 1,500. And about the timing of, of this practice, we consider that is a, a long-term um, practice uh, since it will have a continuity, we hope. The budget is mainly, the mainly resources we need are human resources. Um, we are food fraud inspectors, uh, as me, on other technicians uh, that select and prepare the information to disseminate. We consider more or less uh, 15 part-time people to do this, this job. About the possibilities on, of uh, transferability, um, really we, we have had a very good feedback uh, from the companies uh, who find the, the website, the guides, uh, also the newsletter, uh, very useful tools uh, to keep them up to date with uh, new issues and regulations. And also we consider that this practice is, um, can be very interesting to implement um, to other regions. And that's okay, thank you very much because it was a short presentation of five minutes. Uh, I'm you, on Eva. time now, I hope. <laughs> yes, you were exactly on time, perfect. Exactly on time, uh, perfect, <laughs> thank you. So indeed, in, in these uh, two thematic sessions, we have asked our guests to have these sort of brief flash presentations that should inspire our thinking. Um, and I think uh, Eva, you did that uh, very well. Um, also for the, our audience, you're still welcome to always write your questions to the chat or, or raise your hand. This also goes to our other panelists. If you have any questions, don't, don't hesitate to partake. Um, but maybe uh, I, I would ask the first question also, Eva, just a quick question on, on, on the basis of your presentation that you mentioned 
uh, this interaction between the uh, control administration and the and the companies and it's a you, you found a good way to collaborate uh, through um, workshops and through the information materials you have prepared um, but still I expect it can be sometimes tricky uh, to reach the companies you know get them interested get them to your events so um, how, how have you what is the key to, to getting the SME engagement uh, that they would come and then you know that you could make them aware of the regulations and so on. You mean that the, the same person uh, must not do, do the control and then to... to... No, no, no. I mean, how, what is the... Uh, it seems that you have a good working relationship between the control authority and the companies, uh, but it might be quite difficult for, for other regions to get a similar collaboration framework in place. In fact, do we, we are the control. We are yeah. the control team. We do the official control. Yes, yes, I understand. Yes, I don't understand your question, so you, you, I don't understand what you. Uh, yeah, I don't know how to reframe it. I mean, <laughs> um, maybe Luke, do you, you can, you wanted to say something. You are on mute. Yeah, I'm not muted. No, I cannot see any uh, other question. I, I, I think probably it was about the balance between uh, prevention and repression. Let's say because ah. uh, yeah, you're more. I focused. know. Before in the past, our body was mostly uh, a repression body. Yeah. But um, really, we see now that it's, it's not the only way the, the repression because when you deal with a small and medium industries, sometimes you see the the. Uh, uh, the fraud sometimes, or, or the tricky way to act, are, are not about um, are because they they have a, a lack of, of information. So, a way to prevent fraud sometimes can be giving information to industries. I mean, not only uh, doing uh, a repression act, but doing information before. We do also some uh, another kind of visits in our in our subdirection. We do official visits and another kind of visits, uh, another kind of control visits that are, that are more um, uh, in which we, we, we give information to industries and, and we can, if we detect some, something that is wrong in the industries, uh, we say during the, the visit, but there's not a, a sanction there. Yeah, the, okay. In in a small and medium industries, it's the first visit we we do is this kind of a more um, soft visit. Then mm -hmm. the, the the second one is more um, more more um, sanctionable visit maybe. But we yeah. think that is important uh, before to to give these tools to industries and to yeah. to give the tool that that they can be informed that they can have the tools to. To do this work in a in a good way, <clears throat> in ignorance can be sanctioned. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but thank you. I, know, Emma. I don't know if I have responded to your question. No, you did. It's it's very clear. Yes. Proactively inform the companies. Uh, then with SMEs, the first visit is softer, and then you go into yes. more of the. Uh, Stricture, stricture and, measures. But this, but, uh, and these tools in the in our, in our web and and the guides that we publish, we also think that there are good tools for them yeah. because we, the feedback is very good. They said, "Oh, yes, maybe the first time we go to an industry, they say, yes, yes, I know your web, I know this web, I have your guide, I I'm implementing my traceability with the the help of your guide, and it's a very good tool." And these last years, we have seen that. Medium and small industries have changed the way they they work. Uh, it's better now. Sure. That's, a, that's a good result. Uh, thank you, Eva. You will you will Thanks. stay with us for a discussion. Yes, yes, I stay. Part. Of course, oh. of course, I stay. Yes. Uh, but now I would ask Jerome to do uh, his flash presentation as well. Hi, everyone. Do you see it? Yes, it's perfect. Okay. Hello, thank you for the invitation. I'm Jérôme Sinel, the manager of Interbio Nouvelle Aquitaine, which is the regional organic uh, association of the southwest of France, Nouvelle Aquitaine, which is a bigger region than before due to the merge of the French regions. So we were a member of uh, uh, the Interreg uh, SME Organics, and we have uh, 
uh, implement this uh, uh, program with the tool that I will present now. So 10 years ago, we have uh, created this brand, which is called Territoire Bio Engagé, which means organic territory, literally, uh, because there was a national uh, organic plan that was promoting uh, organic into the field and into the school catering with uh, clearly uh, numbers and in objectives, which is, uh, it was at the time 6% of organic land and 20% of organic food in school catering. But there was nothing to, to enlighten it, to, uh, to value it. So we have decided to create this brand for the municipalities and the public bodies that have reached this goal. So basically it's a, a sign that you put into the entrance of the, uh, the, the canteens or the school or at the entrance of the village or of the municipality. So it's only dedicated to public bodies. Uh, it means that uh, now, 10 years after, uh, we have increased the minimum uh, criteria, which is now 8.5 for the organic land into the municipality or 20% of organic food. And we're gonna even increase this from next year to up to 15% and 20% to get uh, this label for the municipality. So uh, the application is online. We have uh, created a regional jury by representative of the organic sector and local public bodies to, set, to check the forms of the municipality and to give the green light to the certification of the municipality. Every year we control the data of the awardees uh, in school catering to control that they have still above the 20%. And we do it every two years for the hectares of land in organic. So basically this is how, how it works. So what are the purposes of this label? So first is to promote organic food and organic agriculture uh, into the municipality and the school caterings and to to value the commitment of them into organic food. Then, of course, we uh, make an official ceremony. You can see the photo down the template uh, to the municipality with the mayor, with the farmers, both organic and, and non-organic farmers. And then you see on the right of the templates that we can put the sign at the entrance of the municipality. And then you see other tools that we provide to the school catering and, and the, the diploma that we put uh, into the municipality or into the school catering. So it also rewards the work of the school agents and the local politics that uh, want to uh, develop organic. It helps us also to initiate a territorial project with them related to the development of organic food or organic farming. And also it helps to connect the municipality that are certified by this label to share experience and good practice. Every year we make a regional forum where all the municipality and all the farmers that are into those municipalities experience uh, the feedback towards uh, this label. So uh, after 10 years, now we have uh, 226 municipality that have this label at the entrance of the, of the town or at the entrance of the school. Um, as I said, we're gonna increase the criteria next year uh, up to 15% and 22% of uh, organic in school catering. And what is important uh, to us is that we have reached an agreement to, with six other French regions to develop uh, this label on their territory through a license agreement. Of course, uh, uh, it is possible to translate it and uh, there was some plan, especially with uh, some Italian regions to, to have this label also, but uh, with the COVID we couldn't have uh, discussed more about this transferability. But 
I can say to, to one colleague, which is from uh, Basque country, that we have uh, translated this uh, in Basque for the south of a region. So we have some municipality from there that's using not uh, only the French uh, definition of it. So basically the municipality take care of the tools. So they pay for it. Uh, they pay for the sign at the entrance of the, of the village, for instance, and in our organization, we, we employ one person to deal with this label and to, uh, to secure the spread of this label into the French territory. And we take care of the national website of it. So I can put on the chat the, the link with the, the website if you're interested in it. And uh, thank you very much. And I can have your hand, your question if, if you want now. Uh, yes, thank you, Jerome. And I think it's a, a very interesting uh, example, at least in our community, of uh, of a brand that's on for the municipalities. Uh, so a, a lot of other uh, these good practices that have been shared by our projects are are you know collective brands of a specific type of uh, product or product producers or more related to the company side uh, or they're tourism related. But here you're giving uh, a quality label for a municipality. Um, which I find uh, fascinating. Um, what would you say is, do, do SMEs gain something from this as well? So uh, is it, uh, yeah. Well, it, it gains because uh, it help uh, them also to introduce uh, the products into the school mm -hmm. catering of those municipalities. Um, and uh, also some of them have, has put also on their website that they are located in an organic territory. So if they are organic, it's, it's uh, always much better to have a, an environmental, environmental sorry, um, yeah. uh, organic around them. But do you also see that uh, companies are interested to, uh, be, to go and establish their uh, offices or production to a municipality that has that bio label? Or is it too soon <laughs> for that? I think, I think we saw the, the uh, let's say more the opposite, that mm -hmm. uh, there was like some industrial, uh, uh, project in some uh, countryside territory that the local population didn't want, for instance, uh, because it was too big or it was too industrial. So because of this label, they managed to not accept the, the arrival of such a company on their territory. Okay. Uh, Luke, do we have any questions from the audience as well? Yeah, we, we, have, uh, we have two questions uh, which are a bit related. Uh, the, the first question um, comes from, from Stefano. He says, uh, are we talking about certified organic food or is it something like participatory guarantee system? I'm not sure what participatory, because I'm not familiar with the concept, but maybe Jerome, you're familiar with the with well, it's only about certified organic food, uh, so it's it's not um, it's not about the participatory guarantee system, no. Okay, and, and the related question from um, from Ursula is uh, how are the how the requirements are controlled and and, and, and managed? You mentioned I think the jury, but uh, what is the, the the how do you manage the the, the requirements and the measures that the eight point five percent is achieved and and so and so on. So we uh, are also observatory of um, organic uh, agriculture in the region. And we work with the national level to have a, a very precise uh, data on acres of land that are organics in every municipality. So we know in advance if the municipality is uh, uh, in the criteria or not. And this is for the organic land and for the organic in school catering, we ask all the year invoices uh, of uh, the catering and we calculated it to be sure that uh, it's uh, above 20%. Okay, this seems very specific and clear. <laughs> Thank you, Jerome. And we'll also come back to you in the general discussion, uh, but now I would like to invite our third uh, speaker, Hanna. You are welcome to share your screen and. Yes. Uh, 
Okay, hello everyone. So um, my name is Hanna Merilainen and I come from the Regional Council of South Ostrobothnia, Finland, and uh, I work uh, with the Interreg Fritz project. And uh, I'm going to present to you something that we have been working with this development of the food province label that it's that we have here in the region of South Ostrobothnia. So um, yeah, as a good practice, I want to share you how we developed it in, in a pilot project and how it looks like now. So uh, this is this was actually um, how it looks like now. It was developed in a pilot project uh, under Interreg Europe niche. So uh, it was like a one and a half um, year project that we had in uh, um, during the 2018, 2019. The main tasks for the project, we, we wanted to further develop the brand identity, so renew logos and get uh, like more visual elements into it and a stronger uh, storytelling um, uh, touch to the brand and the label and also to create an operational model that uh, so that it would be independent from like uh, uh, external funding. Previously, it was always um, always only uh, apparent and living when we had a development project ongoing. So we wanted to create, create it, to, it to be independent. Well, uh, the regional council, we were coordinating the project uh, as we were partners in, in niche project, uh, but then we had two external experts involved who were very uh, important for the success of, of, of this uh, development and re revision of the food province brand. Um, here we had Food West, uh, that is an expert organization concentrating on food business development and has a very good um, expertise in consumers and uh, marketing of food products and so forth. Then we had also uh, this marketing communications company, Common Marketing, who are as uh, specialized on food, food business marketing and food product marketing. So they were very important for all this visual uh, identity development. Then we had a very active core action group with 25 members from all over the food, food value chain. So development actors and also SMEs. And uh, how we worked with this was that we had meetings where uh, with the core action crew, with the local actors, where we discussed all these brand concepts, ideas, what we want to tell about it for what it's uh, made for. And uh, then we carried out two consumer studies where we tested all these brand concepts. And I think this was very important for the project because we noticed that sometimes our ideas in the local uh, group were very different from the consumers. And for example, this logo, what we have here um, in, the in the core action group, we were like, this is the worst logo. And everyone was saying that this is horrible and so outdated. And then the consumers, they thought this was by far the best logo. And we uh, decided to trust the consumers and chose this logo. Yes, and the project pilot or the project budget was about 50,000 euros. Uh, and how it works like now? Well, the core idea of the label is to increase the sales of the member SMEs and increase visibility of the label holders. It, it is a wider um, brand that we want to like, uh, how do you say, uh, we want to um, communicate about our SMEs and uh, all the things that are happening around the food uh, business development here. Uh, it is managed by the Rural Women's Advisory Organization uh, and there is this rotating advisory group uh, consisting of five to ten members uh, uh, presenting uh, SMEs and also development organizations and they in, in those meetings we decide and approve the applicants and guide the work and activities. And well, the label 
is open for all actors within the food value chain. So in addition to SMEs, it's open for restaurants and uh, also um, like BMBs and touristic sector where they use food products and also research and development organizations. At the moment, there are 50 members in the, in the, who, who have um, joined uh, the label. I must say that when we launched this, it was end of 2019 and the COVID hit two months, three months after. So all the events, what we plan to really uh, launch this label in the region and get uh, members involved, they were cancelled. But we hope that uh, now after two years of COVID, uh, we can start ta uh, taking part in events and really make it more visible. And well, yeah, there is a criteria. When we developed it, we wanted to uh, avoid too strict criteria so that it's not uh, too difficult to manage and maintain but it still should be trustful and reliable for the consumers and and who who see it yeah the criteria it is based on three elements so there needs to be a basic assured quality origin from the region and also cooperative attitude so what I could say about the lessons learned, uh, I think it was in the developing phase, it was all about finding the right balance and also stepping outside of our own local development bubble. So in addition that we <laughs> um, yeah, encourage our stakeholders to get engaged, uh, it was also important to have the consumer perspective and also consumer perspectives from outside the region. So it was, um, that was very important. Well, now the label, it's something that works for all. So it can use for products that are sold in supermarkets, in food products, but it can also be used by, for example, the regional council when we are uh, um, wanting to promote our region as a food province. And I think important for the success was involving also the best possible experts. So we, those were very key to um, the results and how we uh, were able to make this. And yes, I think it's in this visual world. Uh, I, I was also very happy that we were, at least to my eyes, to create this nice looking um, visual identity for, for the label. And it's also important and to have a good story and coherent story. And yes, about the transferability potential, I think the pilot structure, I'm happy to share more information about it, but it's a good starting point to start building a regional food brand or a label. And also uh, I have more information about the operational model and how it works. And I'm happy to share, share information about that also. So this was, this was it. <laughs> I'm open for questions. I can also share the link to the good practice or in the chat. Yes, unless our colleagues have already done that. But uh, thank you, Hannah, for the presentation. Um, I would I would take this one opportunity because if I'm not mistaken, this regional brand, as you mentioned, was developed within this niche project uh, of Interreg Europe, and this meant that you also interacted with other project members uh, from other regions and there was some sort of learning from practices from elsewhere so if you could just say a few words about that if i'm not yes. mistaken ireland was was an inspiration yes yes i think uh yes donegal uh, the food coast uh brand there uh was uh, uh very good um <laughs> what we uh, used as the basis for for the learning yes uh, I, I must say that I was not involved in his project no. <laughs> um, in, in the or in the early phase, but yes. <laughs> yeah, it's fine, but it's just a, a good example because as in Interreg Europe, we always, the reason why the projects exist and these events exist is this learning from each other and just for the audience to know that in this case, the brand that was set up uh, in, uh, in your case was uh, sort of somehow uh, inspired by some other cases that were uh, elsewhere. Um, Luke, do we have any questions uh, to Hannah from the audience? 
Uh, not, not, not yet. No. Okay. That's a good then... reminder to everybody <laughs> to still the opportunity to ask questions. Right, but then it's great that all both the Hannah, Jerome, and Eva are all on on the screen because we have um, around ten minutes to have a discussion on the topic uh, in in a broader sense. So we can sort of even put the, the presentations aside and and think about it in in a broader uh, view. Um, and I would maybe just a uh, question to all of you because and I would now take what Hannah was saying about this uh, consumer perspective. And and I was curious uh, what also Eva and, and Jerome you think. Um, how should the consumer perspective be taken into account when developing a, a branding uh, system, but also for quality uh, quality assurance uh, systems? Because I think Elvira in her keynote mentioned that they are seeing that the customers are demanding sustainability labels on products as a sign of quality as well. Um, so a question to all of you, uh, how should the consumer perspective be taken into account in your opinion? Um, well, I think that not only consumers are demanding sustainability, but also uh, transparency. I think uh, they are increasingly demanding uh, more transparency. They want to know um, which raw material was uh, in, in, in this product. Um, and sometimes even more uh, in which product was uh, plant the, this vegetable who was the producer, um, uh, maybe also which is the, which is the, um, all the chain that is in, in this product, they demand transparency. Is that, um, that's why I think the new, new tools in the future or, or, or now that will uh, allow to have all this information to the consumer. Uh, um, um, it was uh, said before the, I don't know the, the um, blockchain technology for instance that with a code QR that a QR code you you have in in the label all the history of the product can be um, a, a good tool for the consumer but that they are very aware of the of the food crisis they are the tricky ways to to produce and they want to know they want to they need transparency in the products they buy i think they de they demand transparency and traceability, I think. I don't know if you agree. <laughs> yeah, Jerome, do you want to react? Yeah, I totally agree uh, with just uh, uh, what with what Eva said. Uh, just uh, for for our, our brand, it was also to show to the consumer that it is possible to to have uh, twenty percent of organic, um, because there are some rumors sometimes that say that now it's not possible. We don't produce enough, or it's too expensive. So we, with this label, we want to show that it's, it's, it's possible to have uh, um, this uh, amount of organic in school first. And also the second uh, goal is to show that uh, we can have organic and local products together. It's, it's, there is no competition between the two. I think we, we want to prove that uh, organic can be local and uh, also show that it's possible to provide um, uh, food in uh, school catering with local products and inorganic. Thank you. Now, Hannah, do you also want to add something about this consumer uh, perspective? Well, I think in my presentation, I, I, I was trying to <laughs> make, make the point that it's, it's uh, ever more important to, more important to take the consumer perspective <laughs> and um, we should more and more use the knowledge what we have have about it and uh, all, always think about how we can also involve the consumers into the development of the products and uh, it's it's very important. Then I have a second question that's a bit maybe provocative as well um, because we're talking also about branding and then we talked about uh, visual identity and you know this is one means for a company or a region to stand out in you know in regional co uh, competition but also in international competition and so on um, so the provocative question would be uh, you know should a brand or a label also convey quality or are there times where uh, they can you know the quality does not need to be on the forefront but rather it's this promotional and marketing that needs to stand out so what is what are your what are your thoughts on this 
Well, I, I think, well, that's a good question. <laughs> you have to make a decision what you want to really do with, with, with it. If you want to make it uh, very much based on the quality, <laughs> then you choose that direction. And, um, but yes, of course, some sort of quality is, is needed uh, um, always uh, that, uh, yeah, but uh, it's about what you choose and what you uh, really want to do with the brand and the label and uh, what is the main purpose. It's, uh, I think that's what you have to answer first. <laughs> So it's a decision you make in the in the outset of coming up with something like that. Uh, Eva, Jerome. Yes, I agree with Hannah, and uh, also to say that sometimes uh, quality is what will differentiate your product from other products. I know I know in the in this um, if you are a small industry, you maybe you have to differentiate your your product in a quality aspect is uh, the way you can sell it. You, you have your, your place in the market. Yeah. Differentiating in quality aspect, I think is very, yes, it's important thing. And also, as before I say, uh, pro, um, consumer demands uh, quality also. Yeah. Jerome, anything for you, from your side? Does a yeah. brand and label always need to convey quality? <laughs> yes, I think so. But I think that nowadays the uh, food is not a priority for, for, for the expenses of the consumers. So we have to remind uh, them always what is quality and it is a, a long term process. Uh, so, yeah, I agree with what they say, my colleagues say. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll ask uh, also for my colleague Luke, do we have any questions from And we had some thoughts already shared in the beginning by our keynote speakers, but from your side as well, what do you see as the major uh, trends or challenges in the agri-food sector in, let's say, in the next uh, five years? Maybe one trend will be digitalization, yes. mm -hmm. I think. I work in a control body, so maybe yeah. my colleagues will have more, <laughs> another more global vision, but I think digitalization will be uh, an important trend. Also for uh, checking the quality and reporting also, the quality? Also, yes, yes, of course, of course, yes. I don't know what my colleagues think. <laughs> I, think I think that uh, it will be the value chain of the products and to keep the income of the farmers. I think that uh, will be a, a big challenge in the five, uh, five years to come. I agree I with Jerome about the biggest challenge that's making the food value chain fair and sustainable. It's, it's the biggest thing and uh, the things that are happening in the world right now, uh, I, <laughs> it's like they're putting even more pressure uh, all the time and yes you're right because we're, we're sort of we have avoided the issue of of the food value chains that have uh, been disrupted now uh, due to the due to the war uh, but uh, I see okay we have we do have an audience question as well so the question and I think this question maybe is Eva for you but also the others uh, about the QR codes uh, so do you, do you think that the QR codes can work as a source of more information for the consumers on the quality of the origin of the ingredients? Uh, as they can see. Uh, of course, they, it depends on what you put in your, what information you are putting on your code, uh, on your code, core, uh, code. But uh, of course, if it, this code is related with uh, a, um, a chain, for example, a blockchain, that all the information you have there, you cannot change, and it assures that this is a true information, is a guarantee for the consumer uh, about many aspects, but of course about quality aspects. I, I think, yes. 
Matt, we have also a question, but maybe that, that's going to, to be a too long discussion, but let's see, Stefano asks, yeah, the, the, what exactly is quality and how is, what is the, the perception of consumers about quality? How do they recognize quality? But maybe that, that I don't I know if we can have a short, a short version, <laughs> a short answer to that. <laughs> I think one important thing is to of quality for the consumer is that what you read on your label is true. The origin, the ingredients of a quality product for the consumer is that what is in your label, you can believe that all is true. If it's um, no, if, yeah. if, if all the, the ingredients, the origin of the product, the way that it has been produced, everything. So you know what kind of quality you are buying, but all the information must be true. Joel Marwanda, do you also want to react to this question? Well, for me, that would be a quality product that would protect the environment and the, and the health, mm -hmm. but we also need to have a pleasure when we eat or drink. So <laughs> it's a combination of, of all those ingredients, I would say. And I, I think in Europe, we um, start from the point that all the food <laughs> that are produced here in Europe, it should have the quality. <laughs> so uh, it's <laughs> a good question <laughs> again. We should, yeah. Yeah, but then of course the, the quality standards are set on, on the EU level, on the, on the national level, and, and indeed we don't need to open it up further, but uh, um, yeah, th thank you all for the presentations and your discussion. Uh, as, as also Luke said in the beginning, uh, we are happy to facilitate the, the contacts or you also have the links in, in the chat. So if somebody is interested to learn more or you want to follow up on this, you, you are welcome to let us know and, and we will put you in touch with Eva or Jerome or Hannah as well. But now I would hand, hand, hand the word back to Luke for our second thematic session. Uh, and thank you. Thanks. Thank you all once again. Yes, thank you all. Thank you, Mart. We'll uh, we'll now move to the um, the session that dedicated on, on entrepreneurship. I will just also give a few words of um, of introduction. Um, okay, Mart, can you just confirm if everything is fine? I, I confirm. Okay, thank you. So we. We mentioned them, or I mentioned at the beginning, we have five projects uh, dealing with um, with the agri-food sector in the Interreg Europe con con context, and they they raise a series of entrepreneurial challenges. So maybe they are not all of the challenges, but but uh, I try to summarize a bit what what the projects are talking about and which which what is reflected in the, the good practices and the documents they they produce. And so we 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 have. Quite a, um, quite a series of practices about productivity and innovation, which about digital technologies, but other technologies also, and then the skills within the, the, the company. Uh, so we, we have a series of good practice about that. This is especially also raised by the, the Fridge project with a lot dealing with, uh, with the competitive, competitiveness um, issues. So I'm not going into details. Just it's just an invitation to for you to look at uh, the project and what they have as a good as good practices. In case you should not know, we have a lot of discussions uh, we about the market reach. Uh, we've seen the brands, the label, uh, quality aspects, uh, which has been um, discussed today in the pre in the previous session with with Mart and uh, our three speakers. We we have. Um, Discussion about consumer behavior and cooperation with other sectors like education. Uh, for instance, uh, Jerome mentioned the working with schools, the food at school, and even uh, so, this is something important. That other projects are doing that, are working on that, like uh, for instance, the Eurega project. Cooperation with other sectors also. We, we discussed about value chain. So there is a food value chain, but also some projects uh, like the, the Eurega project. Uh, try to open also new value chain and um, working with tourism and hospitality are obvious sectors, I would say, because that, that there is a food related tourism and uh, there is a close connection with uh, between hospitality and food also to, to 
different uh, different approaches. So there's a lot a lot of a lot of knowledge about those uh, those topics, but also the the, um, the cooperative and the clusters, different way to to organize the companies uh, for a better uh, market reach or a better quality. Also, this works together, like working companies working together on the one one brand. There is a lot. We uh, the topic was addressed: sustainable production, uh, the organic organic farming, the circular business models. We we approached that Elvira, in Elvira's presentation, and this is uh, addressed by the SINS uh, AFC project. Even if it's not the the the, the ma major topic of our um, discussion today, of our workshop today, but obviously circular business models are a strong part of the the. The, the development uh, in the in the food in the food sector, we discussed about the local and short value chain already. This is uh, uh, also something which is addressed by quite uh, quite some some projects. The access to finance is also covered by by project because uh, yeah we mentioned before in the, in the initial discussion uh, with uh, with Elvira and, and Chabal investing into new technologies and uh, or changing the business models like moving to more organic farming or to, to circular business models has some costs which uh, and it has risk and those so there is a room for policy to support those investments and support those transformation and de-risking the, the investments of the of the companies so there are quite some practices around around that and that they they are a bit combined in, in the, the, the discussion we'll have now uh, in how new businesses are, are set up and uh, how to promote the new entrepreneurial activities within um, within this agri-food sector. And this is um, the, the, the specific topic of of the session, which which comes now. We will have uh, some three presentations, like in the first, in the, the session before, on specific initiatives fostering the creation of, of companies in different ways in the agri-food sector and and then we'll uh, have a discussion like uh, like we just had with uh, with the other three spe speakers on the on this topic so i would just now give the word to first to to our speakers and the, the first the first would be would be Ursula from the the since ifc project so I'm just giving you the floor Ursula. Hello, everybody. Thank you to share your team. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Here it is. And in presentation mode. It works perfectly. Okay. Perfect. Um, okay. So you can see it in the full screen. It's full screen, also I go on. It's work. Okay, well. perfect. So um, I am from the metropolitan city of Bologna. We are a project uh, partner uh, in the project since uh, AFC that uh, has the goal to promote uh, circular economy in uh, uh, agri-food uh, businesses uh, among the SMEs of um, the agri-food chain production. I am presenting uh, you to this afternoon uh, our good practice uh, agro food big big stands for business innovation center uh, that is an accelerator for uh, companies startups and uh, business ideas uh, in agri food supply chain uh, uh, the main focuses are uh, food and beverage but also industrial farming so the entire what concerns the entire um, product uh, uh, chain uh, the partnership that uh, um, uh, that founded this uh, uh, incubator uh, is made by six private companies that are in the agri-food sector. Uh, so we have uh, Eurovo that is in the egg uh, production, uh, Granalolo in uh, diary uh, sector and uh, so on. Uh, Beside these six private companies, we have uh, three public entities uh, that provide uh, a research support. We have the University of Bologna, we have uh, INEA, that is the National Agency for Research and Art 
Air, that is the agency of the region Emilia Romagna for attractiveness and um, research in the territory. The vision of the uh, incubator is to inspire innovative ecosystems uh, and to design the future of agri-food value chain. This is um, uh, a very inspiring statement uh, that has uh, mainly the goal to support startups uh, in order to make their, um, to transform their ideas into a concrete business initiative. So uh, the idea is to make um, the, the young companies or the startups more close, uh, closer to the, to the market. To do so, uh, the incubator offers to the project, to the selected, selected projects, uh, what they call the real open innovation. So they offer an environment where they can use the pilot plants put at the disposal by the uh, six companies, but also the offices, the shared space and uh, the uh, supply chain network so that they can really test their idea, put it into practice and see what, uh, uh, what works and what doesn't work. Uh, in this way, they can not only uh, grow inside the space of the incubator, uh, inside the, uh, the, the plant, the, fa the, the factory that is working, but also to uh, have a first approach to the market that is a, a kind of a protected uh, approach because they are accompanied, supported uh, by the, um, the companies that, uh, that are in, inside the incubator. And uh, so they, they, uh, they can grow. Uh, uh, we can see that uh, the project started in 2019. The first call was issued in 2020 <laughs> in the middle of the COVID pandemic. <laughs> and this is uh, also a result <laughs> of uh, this project. Um, and in 2021, uh, there, um, there were six uh, startups uh, or business ideas that were incubated uh, in the AgroFood Week. Now the project is ongoing. And to run it, uh, the partner companies put uh, at disposal uh, their plants, obviously, uh, and uh, one member for the board of uh, directors and some research and development staff. Uh, besides that, there is also uh, an annual partner fees. So uh, each partner um, has to pay a fee in order to um, to be part of the incubator and also uh, to uh, enjoy, let's say that, uh, the new discover that uh, the, uh, the new ideas that come from the um, startups incubated. So I will say that um, among the main results, we have the cooperation among the corporation. So we have a network among private big private companies, because uh, most of them are uh, leading companies in their sector, uh, and also uh, with the research entities, so um, private and public sector. Uh, we have uh, what we said before, the open innovation with the open factories, so young innovators can uh, touch with their hands what is going on uh, inside a, um, a big company, uh, and they uh, can directly see the, uh, the process of uh, producting uh, so that they can adjust their ideas. As uh, we said, uh, we have uh, six projects and the call uh, was launched during the pandemic. So uh, we have a strong project uh, in, with the AgriFood Big. The potential for transferability uh, is, um, is wide, I think. Uh, we have uh, the opportunity of open innovation on the territory. So we can have uh, innovation in the territory uh, and we have uh, uh, support for startups. Uh, the startup uh, uh, in this case for AgroFood Big, uh, there is not, uh, there isn't a criteria of um, um, local for local startups. Startups uh, can come from uh, uh, 
worldwide, but uh, uh, you have uh, um, a reason for attentiveness in the territory. Uh, moreover, you have a public-private networking that is always good to grow. Uh, and um, last, uh, lastly, we can uh, have a project that uh, can be self-sustainable in the time because uh, it can be started with public investments. Uh, but then it can become self-sustainable thanks to the company fees. This was really short, but if you have any question, I will uh, answer. And if you want uh, to know more about uh, AgriFood Big, you can go on the website, agrifoodbeak.it. Uh, all the page uh, is uh, in English, so everyone can, uh, can understand what it's written inside. Yes, thank you, Ursula. Lotte shared the, 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 um, also the, 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 the link. And uh, okay, I see the Davide also, maybe it's a colleague of yours or uh, to, to share the link. Um, so please uh, raise your question. I, 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 have, I have some to start with because we, we worked also on, on accelerators. So usually the, um, when, when, when we talk about accelerator, you talk about investments also, is that, is that why the, the, the large companies are, are there for? Are they, they supposed to invest of the company or what, what, what is their expectation? Why, why would those large companies pay for being members, uh, as you mentioned? What, what, what are you looking for? <laughs> yes, um, the, the counterpart, let's say that. Uh, the counterpart for investing is the open innovation. Larger companies uh, um, are... Uh, elephants <laughs> for innovation. Uh, they are uh, slower. They have uh, huge possibilities in terms of uh, resources, but uh, um, they, uh, they are slower uh, in terms of the innovation. In this way, they can, um, they can take the innovation, the ideas of of, uh, other, from other uh, companies without acquiring them, but um, making them uh, um, grow. So with a win-win uh, mm -hmm. idea, so they can profit for, uh, from the innovation and give also the possibility to new companies, new startup to grow up. So to create uh, more jobs, uh, increase uh, the, the economy and, and so on. Okay, so they can become client of the company, for instance, uh, yes. or, or have joint projects. Or okay, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. And uh, do do you have an overview where the the um, for me it's interesting to to where where the the those candidates the six companies co come from? Do they come from research? Do they come from the company, the industry, and, and or is there a mix? Uh, or Actually, there is a mix. Um, uh, there are, I, I haven't done an overview <laughs> here. Actually, we have a mix from, um, there are uh, two um, business ideas, so they aren't a company yet. And we have uh, four companies that are startups. Uh, uh, or, or better, we have three companies that are startups and one company that is uh, um, uh, a already registered company that was uh, founded in uh, 2014. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a mixed uh, yeah, okay. environment. We can, we can see that uh, um, it's the idea what counts and not the, uh, the company. Okay, thank you. Um, Mart, do, 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 do you have questions? Do you see questions? Or? No, not at the moment. So maybe a last question to Ursula, is there also a specific public support for the companies in terms of grants or something? There is not. Uh, it's uh, self-sustainable by private companies, that is always good for public yeah, policies. Okay. Uh, it, yeah, go on, please. It, it's, uh, it's, I mean, it's not easy to, <laughs> manage to get it self-sustainable. I would like to to applause on this uh, on this it's, aspect. It's not at all. It relies on the interest that um, uh, private companies has yeah. into this kind of innovation. Uh, the main uh, engine uh, was that was uh, the uh, idea of uh, um, uh, of. Uh, the innovation that can be produced uh, through the incubator. Yeah. 
Maybe one last question. The big companies, are they locally implemented or did they come specifically for 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 this in uh, to 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 Bologna or had, are they already there? I mean uh, they they were already they there. They are uh, companies that are historically on uh, the territory. Yeah, which is a famous territory for food in any case. <laughs> <Okay>. Exactly. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ursula. So we come back to you and with the other speakers by the end of this, this session, but um, we we can move to Patrick. Hello, i just going to share my screen. Yeah, fine, sure. Can you see the... It works well, it works on uh, your on full screen and it's, uh, we can see and hear you well. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello everyone, everybody. My name is Patrick Devine. I'm a EU project officer in the Northern and Western Regional Assembly in Ireland. So we are um, a regional government body and we were involved in the Interreg Europe Eureka project, um, which uh, the full title of the project was um, European Regions of Gastronomy, Building Resilience and Creating Economic Growth. So it was really about um, working with agri-food businesses in terms of food producers, but also um, with um, more restaurants and how uh, gastronomy can be part of like culture as well and how important it is to different regions participating in the project. So as part of the project, we identified two good practices um, that support um, startup uh, food producers. And the first one is called Foodworks Program. And uh, a little bit of what like Ursula was saying there, it's an accelerator program, but this one is funded by the government. Um, so it's accelerator for high potential and, ab and ambitious food and drink startups. And it was started in 2012. Um, and it's quite unique in that it's a collaboration between three um, state bodies. Um, so these are kind of government funded uh, state bodies that work with um, businesses. And it's very much focused on the rapid scaling and growth of innovative food and drink businesses. So the program runs once a year and they're usually the, the, the call for applications usually opens in around November time uh, for the following year. Um, but in order to, for a business to participate on the product, or on the program, the product has to be quite innovative. Um, so there, there needs to be something quite unique about um, the product. Um, so if, if, you, if you're just going to create another product and you, it's, there's similar products in the market, you probably won't um, get on the program. Uh, and companies must be less than four years old. So I think there's a range of companies that are just a few months old to maybe one or two years old. Um, in terms of the funding for it, um, it's kind of funded by the three agencies in terms of their staff um, time for a business to participate on it. It costs €3,000. But the total support of the, the value to the business is considered around €50,000 um, because the uh, businesses that are successful can apply for a feasibility grant of up to €35,000. And then plus all the business advisors and mentor um, and all the mentoring and uh, the, the opportunity to travel to another region in Europe, all that is valued at over 50,000 euro. Um, so um, this, as I said, the program is quite unique in that it has, um, you're getting any, a successful business that gets onto the program is getting support from all these three agencies. So if we, and they each have different um, areas of expertise, which they can help the business with. So the first one is a feasibility or Enterprise Ireland are very much focused on how to uh, support the business with funding, but also um, with business advisors and how to get the business owners to develop their business plan so that it be like an investor ready business plan. And that, so that's Enterprise Ireland's um, aim. Chagas then, which is the, they provide more of the technical development of the product. 
in terms of like product quality and safety and give also give businesses advice on the technical and regulatory advice of the particular product and each obviously product depending where it's meat or eggs or um ready meals it really, uh, the, the type of technical expertise really depends on the type of product but chagas have a lot of um experts and laboratories and stuff that can provide businesses with that advice and that those services and then the third agency is board beer which is irish for um irish food board um the, they they are board BA generally are very much focused on promoting Irish products all around the world and export markets. So they have offices in a lot most major countries across the world, and they assist Irish companies build their brand internationally and sell their uh, help the companies establish markets across the world. So they provide advice in terms of the sales and marketing internationally and domestically providing consumer insights and development and about also a little bit packaging and branding so the as to summarize these are kind of the benefits there's a series of workshops each successful business gets a business advisor with uh, expertise in the food industry they have access to consumer and market research there's manufacturing and technical expertise from chagas there's international uh, inspiration trip and networking and the feasibility grant um, so it's been running for 10 years. There's over 100 startups that have participated. And these businesses have got have secured around 4.5 million in funding altogether. And over 50% of the businesses are exporting. And there's more information on foodworksireland.ie if anyone wants to find out. Um, the second um, good practice we identified is called the Food Academy Program. And this is for very early startups um, that have started in a, a food business. And the goal here really is to try and get onto the retail um, shelves of one of Ireland's largest supermarket chains, which is called Super Value. So this program is a collaboration between, again, Board Bia, the local enterprise offices, and the Super Value, which is the supermarket chain. And local enterprise offices are located in each county in Ireland as part of the county councils, and they provide um, a, a, a advice to startup businesses, what we call micro enterprises, so that less than 10 employees. So um, the, the businesses that get onto this uh, program um, go through a series of workshops, again, to discuss how to develop the product and the markets. Um, they also get assigned a mentor. And then at the end of the program, they have the opportunity to do a pitch, a presentation to super value to try and convince super value why their products should have a trial on their, their shelf. Um, the, the resources for this program are mostly from the local enterprise office and board BIA and super value in terms of um, their staff time. And uh, the local enterprise office would organize and host all the workshops and pay for speakers and mentors. Um, and to date, there's been over 300 uh, small businesses that have participated in the Food Academy. And those businesses collectively are supporting over 1,100 jobs. Um, and this is the end kind of goal here on the bottom right corner, you can see is to, for these small producers to get an opportunity to have their product uh, on a shelf. And if they're successful with sales, they can then get the opportunity to go on like a national distribution list so they can get their product sold on all super value stores across Ireland. Um, but as well as the opportunity to get on a retail shelf, it's really a good learning journey for the businesses. So they let, get a lot of feedback from store managers to get to do in-store tastings. So they get feedback from consumers about the taste of the product and about packaging. So that it's more so the learning journey, I think, for the businesses. Yeah, and that's me, if anyone has any questions. Thank you, Patrick. So maybe we, we have questions that will come up from, uh, from the audience. My 
I will start with with mine, like for Osola, just to, because you're the, um, coming back to the the Foodworks program, which is also an accelerator. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the um, who want to ask if you have an an, an, an overview? Who, who are the, the 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 investors? Then is it private investors who are active? Are you working with private investors? Is it also pu public investors who? I, th I think initially it would be it would be Enterprise Ireland, yep. which so it's public investment. Which is public, um, yeah. but generally Enterprise Ireland try and match the their funding with private investors. So, um, they, they, if uh, for example, uh, the, I don't know an ex exact example, but it might be like a company is looking for half a million or something like that, or say a hundred thousand. Then Enterprise Ireland will make put in fifty thousand, and they will try and get an angel investor to put in the other fifty thousand. Okay. But um, the if a business looks, is successful in getting that thirty five thousand feasibility grant, that generally show, gives confidence to private investors that it's a quite a good investable company. So yeah. Okay. Look, may I? Please. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, Patrick, really, really interesting. I find it um, the, the, the system that you have, you're implementing or they are implementing that the three business support organizations are coming together and and mm. pulling in their resources and their strengths. And, uh, and this is a really nice way to see how uh, how you can develop a pipeline of services and you know, pinpointing the companies to those organizations that can help them the most and, and all that. But what, what stood out to me on one of the slides, and I was wondering if you could elaborate on it, was this... Uh, uh, regarding the food works program, you had the international inspiration trip. So, what is an international inspiration trip? Uh, that's a good <laughs> question. <laughs> um, I think it could be a combination of things. I think it it comes down to the individual businesses. Um, so, uh, for example, um, I'm just trying to think of an example. Perhaps in Lake Bologna, they have. Uh, World Ice Cream Fair, or um, uh, so it might be. If, say, for example, the company was developing ice cream, that would be an opportunity to go out there and see how other their competitors or potential European competitors are doing it. And uh, it's more of a, like a market research trip and for um, expertise. I think other. It, it really depends on the product because some products are going to be produced in Ireland. Then other products, for example, if you're producing coffee, you're, you know, the coffee might be roasted in Ireland, but it's obviously not grown in Ireland. So it may be a case <laughs> of going somewhere to source the coffee or to source the, the, the products. So I think it, it can depend on a number of uh, different things. But it's still then tailored to, the, to each company. It's not. Yes, uh, I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Patrick. I thought maybe Patrick was a question for related to the Food Academy program. Do, do you see some some may what is the the the, the profile of the the the, app, the applicants? What uh, what uh, where do those people come? come, I, come from? Generally, they're very small early stage businesses. Sometimes they're referred to as artisan producers. Okay. Um. So sometimes it, it's usually. They only have one or two employees. There may even be some businesses that have, uh, it's an entrepreneur who actually has a full-time job, but they would like to start a okay. food business. So, and perhaps they're selling their product at a local market or a local Saturday market. And this is an opportunity for them to uh, start selling in a retail uh, environment. Yep. So yeah, generally um, it's hard to say, I think, there is examples then of companies that have perhaps supplied, they may be one or two years old and they've only been supplying their local market, but they want to start to grow a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it's, it's almost a test of the company because one, it's a test to see if consumers will purchase it. So, you know, if you think about when a consumer, it, the price has to be right, the quality, the taste, the packaging, mm -hmm. there's a lot of boxes to tick there. So that's probably the first test. Um, generally, the businesses sell in perhaps, say, for example, most counties have four or five super values. So you might just be selling the first um, few, initially, first few super values. But if, if it's successful, then super value would ask you to, to sell nationally, which is a lot more stores. 
So that's a test then to see if the company can scale up production. Yep. Um, so that that's a and, and there's a that's a real learning journey for the businesses because some businesses find they're not quite ready to scale up or it takes them longer and or they may may need more resources. So um, yeah, well, it, so and I, it depends on the, the business too. But a lot of businesses struggle to uh, communicate or get get on to retail stores, especially if they're in a competitive market. So um, this is a good way to get in front of super value um, managers and buyers. Yeah, it's like a proof of concept for the, for the yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Patrick. Do we have a question still for Patrick? Uh, can't see any, I think, Matt. So no, maybe we then uh, we go back to Patrick uh, together with Ursula by the end of this session. We can move to Anna Katarina from Germany, who's the third speaker of our session. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, the sound works. Very good. So I hope you can see my screen now. That works fine too, yeah. Okay, nice. So hello everybody. My name is Anna Katharina Distler and I'm from Bavaria, Germany, and I'm working at the Competence Center for Nutrition. Anna Katharina, maybe just to specify you you at the test you mentioned you have camera issues, that's why you don't you don't show up. It's not because you don't you don't want to, but we your camera uh, didn't, yes, I can... did, didn't allow to show up. Ah. <laughs> I can yeah, I can try again, but I think it still doesn't work. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's 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 fine. Um, we hear you when we see the slides, but it's it's not because you wanted to hide because but your computer doesn't allow you to share you. No, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm really it's sorry. <laughs> please go. Please go on. Please go on. Okay. Okay. So um, I'm really sorry for my technical issues, but I hope you can see my screen and hear my voice. And I hope that helps you a little bit to get a, a little introduction into the Good Practice Food Incubator. And um, we are currently part of the Interregular Project Rich. And um, you maybe uh, you heard something of my colleague from my fridge colleague, Hannah, before. So um, uh, a few information about the Food Startup Incubator. Yeah. Um, the Food Startup Incubator um, supports founders and startups in the food sector who want to contribute in building a sustainable world and um, want to um, produce new food products. And the Food Incubator is led and also um, built up by the Public University of Applied Sciences by Stefan Triesdorf. And the initiative supports um, startups and founding teams with innovative and sustainable food ideas through four main aspects. Um, the first is providing infrastructure and in the food production in laboratory and pilot scale, as well as co-working spaces, um, teaching and training in the field of food technology, entrepreneurship, business and um, business administration and finance, and providing fin financing instruments for the startup growth and scaling up phase, uh, for example, providing information about current um, scholarships, um, and also um, network to fellow startups, food technology and entrepreneurship experts, um, business angels and investors and uh, retailers. So, um, uh, so what makes this initiative so special is the partnership of four partners by providing expert knowledge and technical machineries. You can see those four. Um, those four partners are um, the main um, the main um, expert uh, experts who help startups in building up their business in um, providing technical issues and um, I want to uh, go a little bit further in detail. So the HSVT University of Applied Science is um, the founder of the Food Startup Incubator and they can um, provide production and laboratory facilities. So you can go into the university and test your product. You can produce it in small scale, you can produce it in a uh, big scale and they can provide you expert advices and food technologies and enable and scale up to small scale industrial cereal production. 
the IU International University um, help through e-learnings on legal requirements for launching a food startup and also on legal requirements how you should label your product, what information must be on the food, uh, food um, products and on the food packaging. Um, the SCE promotes innovations among food startups and motivates and empowers entrepreneurial thinking and acting. The start in food um, helps with expertise in online marketing, sales strategies, advice in building business models and financing such as crowdfunding. Um, now a few information is how you can use the food startup in Cobato for your startup. So um, because the this initiative is um, built up by a university or the students of, has, um, of this university can use all facilities free of charge. And the food startup have the possibility to get access to the diverse pilot plans and production areas via user agreement. So external founding um, teams or single founders who are not part of the university can use those um, program of the food startup in Cobato for something like a um, certificate program. It's called founding a food startup. And this certificate program consists of two semesters. And within those two semesters, the founders learn how to develop a food product and how to build a business in the food sector. Um, this all is done via workshops and individual coaching appointments and the aim of the certificate program is either the founding of a food company or applying for an existing founding scholarship provided by, for example, the German government. So, next slide. Um, so, this human resources um, and the expert teams are, um, I think, very special and I think Anna, this Anna, is um, we cannot because the, we cannot see the next slide. Maybe you need to move. Ah, sorry. Yes, sorry. So um, I think what makes the food startup incubator so um, successful and um, so special are those four partners I talked about before, because you can see a constantly growing number of food startups in the incubator. Um, currently, there are 19 startups who used the um, program to build up their startup. Um, the Food Startup Incubator was uh, founded in March 2019, so that is not a long time, and they already have 19 startups. I think that is a great number. And um, the Food Startup has 50% female founders, um, which is highly successful. Um, I think that also is linked because of the um, good opportunities for students to use those Food Startup Incubator for free. And within those two years of um, the food startups, they launch different initiatives, for example, the hospitality initiative, the farmer initiative, and how to become a female founder. And um, just uh, information on one of those um, initiatives, I don't want to talk too much because um, I don't have so much time. So, um, for example, the farmer initiative, they have a lot of participants and they want to support, especially farmers who already produce something and they want to uh, make um, themselves more um, successful and more seen in the region and they want to sell their own products more in the region. So um, they have different workshops on maybe uh, other topics mentioned before, uh, teachings and trainings and food technologies and also marketing, that, which is a big topic and yeah that's it i hope um i could present to you a little bit more about the food incubator and if you have some questions don't hesitate to contact me thank you Anna. i'm just looking for questions but starting with the first one maybe where um where does the, the funding come from this uh, this uh, incubator who who, pay, who pays for that um, uh, some of the uh, moment I have written that down. Um, most of the financing is coming from the university mm -hmm. and only the students working uh, um, or studying at the moment at the university can use the food startup incubator for free and all other student um, startups have to pay a little fee for using um, the startup incubator. 
Okay. Um, but mostly of the um, financing comes from um, the government and f um, through the university and a little bit also from the international university and from for those four main partners. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, and I understand it's deeply integrated in the in the studies actually, no? because you mentioned also that, that, that if you come from, from external, you can, you integrate a kind of scholarship program uh, when you when you go to the to the incubator. No? Yes, yeah. yes. Um, but uh, you don't have to make that much to also use the food uh, food startup incubator if you're external because they don't want to make it such a hurdle to build up a startup and okay. they want everybody to um, be able to participate. And I Okay, understand. Yes. And I agree with you. I think it's good, quite good numbers for for young young initiatives. So, so it seems, seems yes. to 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 work to work well. And uh, yeah, the, for, for those who do not know, I, I'm I'm living in, in Germany. The name is also Ryan Stefan is quite quite famous, <laughs> quite famous brand. So maybe that helps also. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think. Um... I also want to mention one other, uh, one other point. Um, I think what is also very great is that you can connect to other startups. Um, they have an online platform and you can, they have a whiteboard and you can, can connect to everybody in this network and they have about 800 registrations. So you can um, just go to the whiteboard and um, asking for raw materials or for other Mm -hmm. um, startups that may be doing literally the same thing and connect and, uh, yeah, share um, opinions. And I think that's also a very nice. Uh, okay, thank, thank yeah. you, Anna. Thank you for that. So we, <laughs> we have the link also in the, in the contact details in the, the, the chat, the, for the, the link to the, the, the good practices and to the project for the um, people can contact you. I would just maybe uh, see Pat, uh, Patrick and Ursula um, are still with, with us. And we, we are just a few minutes, so we don't have much time, but I would like to, to com come back to, to, to questions we, we had through the, um, throughout the, 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 the session, the, the, the workshop. Uh, we discussed many trends, the digitalization, the, 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 the sustainability, the, the circular transformation, and uh, can you see in your initiative, in those initiatives, or maybe you have also a broader view, which are on, in your regions the, 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 the major trends and which, which drive those, those business, business creations, those, those new businesses? What, where are they going for? Are they going, what, yeah, what is their, their, main, their, their main challenge or their main, their main topic of the core? I think uh, the main topic of those startups in the food uh, startup incubator is um, they want to keep the whole value chain in the region. So the raw material production and the production okay. of the uh, of the products. And I think um, the startups um, and the food startup incubator I talked to always didn't have that high machinery. So little machinery and not that uh, digitalize, uh, digitalized, but yeah. more um, they focused on keeping the whole value chain in the region. And a big point was the marketing. The marketing um, always uh, or mostly happened online also because of COVID and um, they are working on mostly the websites and online jobs. And I think that is a big part in digitalization and also connecting with other SMEs, connecting with the consumer and Building up a network. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Anna. Ursula or Patrick, who wants to? Ursula, maybe? I, I agreed uh, with what said Anna and uh, Anna Katarina, and I would like to link to that uh, just to stress the importance of a network among companies. We have seen lately um, here that there is a need uh, among SMEs to link to build a network uh, in order to be stronger and to um, share the, the burden or also to share the information and uh, um, face the difficulties uh, in, a, in an easier way if it's possible, because um, uh, really often uh, having the information or having the support 
uh, is uh, crucial uh, for uh, an SMEs in order to, um, to, to grow, to survive, uh, maybe, uh, or to increase uh, their, uh, their, uh, their <laughs> selling uh, and so on. Uh, we've seen that in here in Bologna, we can see that uh, uh, the, uh, there is a special attention for uh, what is local, uh, the, uh, especially for what concerns the, the, the agri-food sector. Um, people, if they can, uh, they would like to buy local. And so we have uh, local markets that are, uh, that are increasing in, in this territory and we are trying to supporting them as we can also towards uh, more circular practices in order yeah. to uh, make them, uh, uh, yes, uh, grow, but in a way that can be sustainable uh, in line with the European also uh, goals and objectives. It's not easy to balance the, the local aspect and the scale, the scale up aspect now for in, in a- Yes, in <laughs> yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, go on. No, no, as I said before uh, in the previous session, um, talking about digitalization, uh, it's really hard for a farmer that uh, maybe uh, may, uh, it's uh, an SME is uh, all alone or with uh, his or her family, family to uh, think to scale up with the digitalization and to be uh, trained for that and to work also in that. Thank you for that, Orsula. Patrick, I think that the last words are for you. For, for you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, just what uh, Anna and Ursula were saying, um, <clears throat> that startups working together in a program, the peer learning element of that is very important. And I think that's one of the uh, benefits that businesses that participate in the food works and the food academy say is that actually working with the other startup businesses is very beneficial to them and they learn as much from them as they do from the experts yep. um, just on the digitalization yeah i think that uh, is very important and it's what anna was saying too um, when i spoke to board bia um, earlier today they said that there was a dramatic increase in the number of businesses starting to sell online and and because of COVID-19 has really accelerated this and mm -hmm. consumers expect um, to get their products online and of course during COVID-19 people were trying to stay indoors more but still wanted their favorite products so they expect to buy it um, online so that has definitely accelerated that um, but so that that's hugely and it's not just the selling part of it I think there's um, the, the, the digitalization uh, comes affects all parts of the business from production to um, how you can connect with consumers. But there's also yeah. all sorts of opportunities for digitalization in terms of being more efficient and uh, operations within a business as well. Um, but as we, and you mentioned just about trends, um, one thing I suppose we've noticed uh, from Board Bia again would have highlighted from the Food Academy Food Works program is there's quite an uh, increase in the number of vegan type products um, that, for example, maybe six or seven years ago, we would not have seen. So uh, and it, even businesses that typically wouldn't have uh, produced vegan products, now they feel they, they have to have a vegan option. So you might have a company that, like a, a dairy company that might be producing yogurts or some sort of a chocolate or has originally would have a dairy milk based yep thing they're now producing vegan alternatives so there's yeah. it's uh, definitely an increasing market there so very much linked also like like the local food to consumer behavior as well, to, yes to expect and consumer like also i mentioned on the local food and, and so on okay F thank you for that i will we we clo clo close here the, the discussion there would be more to say but hopefully there will be further exchanges in the project and in further further events Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Ursula. Thank you, Anna, for, for being with us this, this afternoon. And for, for closing, I will give the, the word back to my colleague, Mart, who has some words for, for us. Yep. Thank you, Luke. And then thank you once again to the speakers. Um, yeah, I mean, we're thematically, uh, I hope that, you know, the day has, has we discussed many topics, you know, we started out with these large networks and, and the trends, um, both on the 
sort of look, looking towards the future level, but also very practical concerns of farmers. And then uh, we went into the labels and the quality aspects. And now we, we've discussed on entrepreneurship. So they're all broad topics. Uh, today we touched the surface on this. Um, and I think in, in all sessions, what came through was this element of the added benefit of peer learning, uh, both among farmers, among companies, but also among policymakers. And this is, you know, the spirit that we in Interior Europe uh, policy learning platform also work. So in the last five minutes, um, I will just go over a few things that what we would look continue to do and how we could be helpful for you. And, you know, some of you are very familiar with Interreg Europe, some are, are maybe less so. So in these next uh, few slides, I hope uh, I will make it more clearer uh, as well. Uh, in the meantime, um, also my colleague will share a feedback survey, so you can you can give your feedback to this today's event, and it will be shared in in chat. Um, but uh, on the program level, I'm I'm sure that you know that there's a new interview program starting soon, and just for you to know that the purpose will remain the same. So it's still about improving regional development policies uh, through exchanging experience, the same peer learning we talked about. Uh, but there's a slight uh, change in the countries involved and the budget. Um, so the, the uh, UK is no longer part of the program. Um, and these four thematic priorities we've had so far, they are a bit reshifted, recategorized. Uh, there is one cross-cutting priority in capacity building in the new program. Uh, and a lot of uh, sort of thematic focus will be more put on sm smart and green. Uh, but uh, uh, Luke and I and the projects that we have in this SME competitiveness, they will largely be under the smart category. Uh, and we will, uh, with the policy learning platform, we will continue also to uh, keep on getting events and, 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 and supporting projects in the SME competitiveness track. Uh, but just to know that there is this slight visual and thematic focus change also happening. Um, but um, of course, the, the best way to hear about all of this uh, is from the program authorities. Uh, and then just to highlight for you that the 5th of April is this big annual launch event uh, this year uh, where the, the new first call will be announced and, and you know, they, you go, the Secretariat goes into details about the new program and how it's, how it's set up. Uh, and there you can also see that the 31st of May is the deadline for the applications. And, uh, and yeah, so do, do join the 5th of April event if you are interested on the on the project level, that you too want to be part of be part of a, a, a three to four year project working on policy improvements, like we had today, speakers uh, representing various projects, um, then you are welcome to attend this event. Uh, but of course, you also don't have to become necessarily a project member to be to make use of our services that we provide with Luke and our colleagues through the policy learning platform. Uh, so. We function as a, as a website and as a contact point to do our experts and networks. And then so we have a rich database of different good practices, some that were shared today and, and we have various publications you can look up. Uh, we have a community of peers, over 20,000 20, members on our platform. So a good way to, to find like-minded um, specialists from around Europe uh, to collaborate with. And then we have specialized support services that we provide. And these are, um, available to policymakers uh, around Europe, so you do not need to be a project partner to make use of these services. You can, you can just be uh, a representative, a policymaker who is interested uh, in making better policy, and then uh, we are here to help you. Um, and just with this slide, uh, I won't go into details, but I wanted to highlight that today's topic on agri agri food is just one of the sectors, one of the topics we've zoomed in today uh, under the. SME competitiveness uh, theme, we, we work with various topics, digitalization, uh, scaling of businesses, entrepreneurship in a general sense. So all these topics that also are important for the agri-food sector, we also tackle them in a broader sense in our various events and publications and, and so on. Um, um, so uh, you're welcome to keep on keeping an eye on what we're doing uh, because I think there are a lot of topics that are cross-cutting anyways, uh, cross-sectoral as well, uh, that could be of interest uh, for you. Um, also, do, if you're new to this platform, just for you to know that the, the uh, policy learning platform works on four thematic areas. So we also have been research and innovation and low carbon economy and environment and research efficiency. And we have other colleagues working on these uh, uh, thematic areas. Uh, they are having their uh, events uh, across this week as well. And this is a good opportunity to invite you to join, join us tomorrow uh, when we have our event on research and innovation. 
Um, so there's a focus on digital innovation hubs and then also on uni university and industry collaboration and looking at S3 implementation. So uh, if you have the time, if you're interested uh, tomorrow, uh, the focus is on research and innovation. Um, and then what we always promote as well is our personalized policy advice services uh, that are free of charge for policymakers. Uh, so you can, whenever you have a question about some topic, be it agri-food or SME digitalization or something else, you are welcome to uh, use the policy help desk. So to write an email through our website about your question, and then we will uh, get back to you with useful materials and resources. And then we are also providing matchmaking sessions and peer reviews, which are tailored services to policymakers. So today we're here in a larger setting in a, in a workshop, uh, various presenters and, and discussion, but uh, we also organize events that are uh, private and tailored uh, to, uh, to the needs of one uh, region. So if you have a policy challenge, for example, uh, you, you want to develop uh, the agricultural sector in your region, uh, you want to provide uh, some sort of support for SMEs, maybe you want to provide some training on digitalization, but you're not fully sure on how to do this the best way, then you can reach out to us and we can set up a matchmaking session or a peer review with experts from Europe who have done something similar. So maybe some other regions have already had very well working uh, digitalization upskilling uh, workshops for, for um, rural entrepreneurs, then we would be glad to put you in contact and facilitate this two hour or two day exchange of ideas. Um, so uh, you're welcome to check them out and write to us an email and we'll gladly explain uh, further on, on what they are about. Um, but I think this is my, my last slide and it sort of concludes the day. Uh, so thank you for being with us. I, I hope uh, you've had an interesting uh, uh, day and you've, you've got some new, new ideas. Um, and uh, we will stay online uh, with some of the people who registered for a help desk session in advance. Uh, so we will, Luke and I will be here um, and we'll come to you shortly. So those who, who registered in advance, but for everybody else, uh, thank you for being here uh, with us today. Uh, keep enjoying uh, the policy learning week. And then hopefully we will meet again uh, either on 5th of April or some other context uh, with our services. So thank you for your attention.